Need to unmute, unmute Dave. You're muted. Always helps. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're very privileged to have, I think, two excellent speakers uh, tonight to uh, uh, start the uh, proceedings. Um, Fran Graham's uh, involved in the uh, London Cycle Campaign uh, and uh, has been a, a key mover and shaker there. Um, obviously, a lot of us in uh, Yorkshire are quite jealous of what uh, has been achieved in London and the uh, uh, London Cycle Campaign has been a, a key pressure group and mover behind what's uh, what's been done. Um, other interesting things have been going on, particularly uh, low traffic neighbourhoods in London. Um, and uh, 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 both Fran and uh, other colleagues in the uh, campaign, I think, have a good knowledge of what's been going on there. So um, given the challenges that we're facing in Yorkshire in terms of uh, promoting active travel, uh, and particularly on the uh, cycling side, which is the uh, prime focus tonight, um, that's uh, both in terms of what we've been able to achieve in the past, but also trying to take uh, maximum uh, opportunity from the government's uh, increased emphasis uh, on active travel uh, and the emergency uh, funds that were made earlier in the year because of the COVID situation. Um, you know, what's, what's been done in London, London experience is probably going to be extremely helpful uh, to us in understanding what we can uh, look to uh, achieve in Yorkshire. So, um, well, uh, Fran's uh, going to be our first speaker. She's indicated that she will speak probably for about uh, 10 minutes, uh, but we will allow up to 15. <laughs> I'll give her a, a one minute uh, notice before the end of that. Uh, so welcome, Fran. It's great to have you with us. Uh, and we're certainly looking forward to what you've got to say. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, really great to see so many people on the call. Um, so yeah, and thank you for that introduction. So yes, my name is Fran. I'm the uh, campaigns coordinator at the London Cycling Campaign, but I've actually been involved in the environmental movement for uh, over a decade now. So um, I did environmental science at university and then I uh, was involved in various sort of grassroots campaigning before working at Friends of the Earth in their food and farming teams, in their air pollution teams. And that's when I moved over to uh, the London Cycling Campaign, um, working with their local group network and on major campaigns there. So um, I've got a long history uh, in the, the climate in the climate movement and uh, I've had my hands in various pots and that's where I sort of come into the cycling uh, world from. I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not a racer or uh, a long distance biker. Uh, my bike is my mode of transport and um, it was always fascinating to me. I, I grew up in London and, uh, you know, all the kids would cycle in London. We'd all go to the park, we'd all ride. Um, but I was one of the few people who apparently didn't stop. <laughs> so I was one of the few people at my sixth form who was still riding to sixth form on bike. I was still one of the few people in my early jobs who was getting about by bike and that continued. Um, so it's always been a uh, key thing that I've been involved in and key thing I've been uh, working towards. Um, I'll start my presentation now. I've got a couple of slides for you. Uh, so let's see if I can get this up. Wonderful. Um, so for those of you who don't know much about the London Cycling Campaign, we're an organisation that started about 40, uh, just over 40 years ago. And we actually came out of the environmental movement. So a lot of people who were involved in sort of uh, Sea Shepherds, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace got together in London over 40 years ago and decided they wanted to focus specifically on enabling cycling in the city. Um, and that's our key focus. It's enabling everyone who wants to be able to cycle in London to do so. Um, a lot of my slides are quite London focused. So I'll try and keep it quite broad because I think a huge amount of it does apply to elsewhere outside of London. And I want to sort of take everyone back a little bit to the start of uh, this year because there was a lot going on. Um, COVID has obviously been a huge, uh, had a huge impact on everyone's lives this year. But before COVID, we still had a lot of urgent and important crises that uh, we were all facing. So we had uh, air pollution crisis that was causing early 
fatalities. We had uh, congestion problems. Uh, we had uh, extreme weather events. And in 2018, we obviously had that, uh, you know, Canary in the Coal Mine report from the, uh, the UN, the IPCC, saying we essentially had 10 years uh, left in 2018 to stop ourselves from locking in over 1.5 degrees of warning. We were given a very specific time frame from them. So we were facing quite a lot of things uh, before COVID anyway. And then when it comes to emissions and uh, carbon emissions from the UK, we were looking at, okay, so we were doing quite well on uh, power. We had made massive strides in decarbonizing our power structures. They're not quite there yet, but they're getting there. Um, and with various other uh, key sources of emissions, things were starting to move in the right direction. The uh, one that wasn't and stubbornly wasn't moving was surface transport. So transport as a whole is one of the largest sources of emissions. Surface transport is about 20% of the emissions from our transport emissions uh, budget. So surface transport is a key source of emissions. It's also one that's not changed significantly, um, which is incredibly striking when you think about the efficiency in motor vehicle yeah. engines that has happened in recent years despite that efficiency improvement in the engines, there has still been no reduction in emissions, which just goes to show yeah. how tricky it is and how neglected it's been in terms of climate action and uh, concentrated effort to reduce emissions from that. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about uh, EVs, so electric vehicles. Um, this is often put up when you start talking about road transport emissions, when you start talking about surface transport, um, there are a lot of people who are essentially putting all their eggs in the electric vehicles uh, solving issue. If we can get everyone driving EVs instead of combustion engines, uh, it's all magically fixed. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Even if you set aside the fact that uh, if I had a magic wand and I waved it and tomorrow every single vehicle in the UK was a EV vehicle, we'd still have the issues of road danger, congestion, air pollution from the particulate matter from the brake pads and everything like that. Even setting that aside, um, electric vehicles still have carbon emissions connected to them. So uh, because we don't have a completely decarbonized power system at the moment, we still have uh, fossil fuel emissions associated with the charging of electric vehicles. And then there's the embedded uh, carbon involved in creating the vehicles in the first place. So they're not carbon neutral at the moment. Um, and I think there's been some provisional work done by the Tyndall Centre, which essentially looked and said, right, if we take the assumption that from 2035, every single new car sold in the UK is going to be an ultra low electric vehicle, will that meet our targets? And the result that they came up with was, we can't expect to have a situation where we are on a well below two degree path unless we have a 60% reduction in car mileage. I think it's 58% reduction, so nearly 60%. So we can't just rely on EVs to, to solve the issue of carbon emissions from surface transport. We have to, have to uh, involve mode shift in that. So we have to shift everyone away from uh, motor vehicles, particularly private motor vehicles, and towards active travel, towards other transport options. So around this time last year, um, as an organization, we sat down and we sort of started looking at this problem. We started looking at this issue and thinking about, okay, well, we've got this deadline of we need to drastically reduce our carbon emissions in uh, by 2030 if we want to avoid this over 1.5 degree pathway of warming. We know that uh, local councils in particular have huge powers over the roads and we know this is a big area of carbon emissions. So how can we as a organization, as a London cycling campaign, be a proactive voice, a positive voice within this space? And what we came up with was a report Called Climate Safe Streets. Um, I can circulate the link in the chat box once I've finished uh, my presentation. But the result of it was eight key policy areas that we believe that if the mayor and councils in London uh, pursued and were very proactive on, we'd be able to reach that uh, decarbonised road system in the next 10 years. 
And those key eight, eight key policy areas are on the slide now. So um, rapidly expanding the cycling network in London, um, supporting access to low carbon shared mobility options. So e-scooters, e-bikes, shared uh, electric vehicle car clubs and smart road user charging. So an evolution of the congestion charge that would be much fairer, that would make sure that the most polluting and damaging uh, motor vehicle trips paid for that. And then that would be also supported by five additional policy areas. So rolling out zero emission buses, uh, low carbon freight transport, uh, so supporting the switch to low carbon freight, um, supporting the uh, switch to low carbon vehicles. So again, EV being part of the mix, but not the whole solution. Car free planning um, would be really key and uh, low traffic neighborhoods is also a really important part of that network, but also part of that planning for town centers. How do you make sure that they are low traffic? And by pursuing these eight policies, we believe that it would be possible, as I said, to decarbonize the road network in uh, 10 years time. We published this report uh, in March, um, and then the world changed quite a lot. So uh, the COVID crisis kicked off uh, really uh, at the end of March, and we had our first uh, national lockdown. And what we saw over that lockdown um, was a massive drop in motor vehicle movements, uh, a massive drop in pu um, public transport ridership, but we saw huge jumps in the number of people cycling. Um, we saw people rediscovering cycling who'd never uh, ridden the bike before. We saw people rediscovering cycling, you know, dragging, uh, we were getting loads of reports from bike shops of people pulling uh, bikes into the shop for a service, which had, you know, spiders trailing off it and bits falling off it because they pulled it out of the shed and wanted to get it serviceable. Um, so there was a, massive boom in cycling and this was mainly driven uh by the fact that the roads were quiet and empty uh safety is still the number one barrier to people cycling and so when people found the roads empty they took to the roads on their bikes but as we started to transition out and the motor traffic started to climb back up we had some real uh decisions to be made about how the road system was going to look and behave as we transitioned out of lockdown um, the average car in the UK is parked 96% of the time. So if you imagine everyone who's now nervous about being on public transport because of COVID, all suddenly getting in their cars and getting on the road network, the road network wasn't going to cope. And it's one of the reasons why councils and government was so nervous about uh, not enabling active travel as we transitioned out of lockdown. Um, obviously connected with a surge in motor traffic would be a surge in air pollution. And given that we are in the midst of a respiratory pandemic, that's the last thing anyone wants. And obviously the surge in climate emissions and congestion as well. So the last thing anyone really wanted was a car-based recovery. Um, and that's why we've seen things, um, as Dave mentioned earlier, um, the, the government support for active travel coming out of the first lockdown. So we had the Emergency Active Travel Fund, the first tranche of which we've seen the results of uh, across the country in terms of the uh, interventions that have been made. Um, the second tranche, um, there is another one coming. Uh, the announcement's due on that imminently. So there will be another round of funding going out to councils to enable active travel as we continue this transition. Um, and the other thing that happened uh, during this time was that the government were also really clear about the guidance that they were giving to councils. So in London for quite a while, we've had some very uh, clear guidance from TfL about the level uh, of the standard that cycling facilities should be uh, constructed at. That hasn't always happened across the rest of the country. It's been very, very patchy. Some counties are still just doing paint on the roads rather than physical separation on busy roads. Um, and actually these key principles that are up on the slide now are the uh, designs that as a cycling organization, we have been pushing really hard to see standardized. Um, so things like routes must be direct and these routes must join together. Um, 
Uh, you can't just mix cyclists and pedestrians and think that that is good provision. And you also shouldn't be putting in barriers and asking cyclists to dismount. This is all really excellent stuff. And this all came out this year, which is fantastic. Um, just quickly, I'm going to rattle through a couple of the interventions um, that we're seeing. So uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, um, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but I'm expecting I'll get quite a lot of questions on. So I will happily answer any that come through later. But they're essentially point closures across an area that stop through traffic. So traffic can still, motor traffic can still access the area, but can't go through the area. And cycling and walking, active travel, it's all permeable. Um, we also have physically protected cycle lanes. So um, in London in particular, we're seeing lots of ones going up. Um, that's really great to see, and it does provide a level of protection. Uh, school streets is another thing. So this is a time closure at school drop-off and pick-up time outside a school. Um, and it really does have a behavioral change impact. Uh, this is a school street where they've the kids have taken over and drawn all over the street. It's lovely. And we've got about 350 of them implemented so far in London since the Emergency Act of Travel Fund. Um, I'm expecting we'll see far, far more of them. And lastly, pavement widening. Um, so making sure that there's enough space, particularly around really busy interchanges. So this is in South London, it's Brixton. It's an incredibly busy area usually. So allowing that space for social distancing. Um, so the thing that after all of these interventions, we're looking at, okay, so what would a green and fair recovery look like? What are the roads that we want to see? How do we make sure that they are low carbon, they have cleaner air, they're equitable? Uh, the social cohesion, I think, is a really important subject that doesn't get talked about as much as I think it should in terms of we saw this massive explosion of mutual aid groups in the first lockdown. And again, we're seeing a resurgence of them now. But that idea that all these small community groups have come together and really strengthened that community bond, that community interaction, um, we don't want to lose that. And we know there are studies, many, many studies that show that busy roads are a barrier to social cohesion. So not losing that. And also supporting the healthier and active lifestyles that we know that we need. Um, the thing that I put up is something that's getting talked about quite a lot at the moment, which is the 15 minute city. So the idea that everything that you need from your doctor to your dentist, to your kids school, to uh, your workplace are all within a 15 minute walk and cycle. Um, this does all of those things, um, which is great, but it can't be done without embedding those cycling and walking interventions that are so key. Um, and the other thing I mentioned is the emergency measures that we've been talking about are fantastic and it's great to see them going and it's great to see them going in at speed. But they are just one of those eight priorities that we've identified as leading to zero carbon roads in the next 10 years. So yes, we need to see a continued rollout of those emergency measures, but we also need to start looking at what are the other things that we need to do to make sure that we bake in this uh, green and fair recovery from COVID. And I've got one last slide and then I'll stop talking. Um, and the last one is just on the importance of local campaigners. Um, political will for all of this stuff is so important. And we have uh, local campaigners in nearly every borough in London and they have been vital to achieving the uh, pressure and the quality of cycling infrastructure that we've achieved so far. Um, without that push, without that backup well, of politicians that they're some, doing yeah. the right thing, that they are on the right path, um, it's far too easy for them to buckle and back out. So the importance of local campaigners, I can't stress it enough. We can't do what we do without you guys. So um, yeah, that was all from me. Right, thank you very much, uh, Fran, uh, for an uh, excellent uh, presentation covering all the uh, climate change issues through to the uh, some of the uh, practicalities uh, on uh, on the cycling. Um, right, our second speaker is Paul Osborne, uh, who for many years uh, worked for Sustrans. I, I used to deal with him on safe routes to uh, school wearing a, a previous hat of mine. Um, and he's a key person uh, leading the West Yorkshire uh, Cycle uh, Forum. Uh, and uh, deals with active travel on behalf of Sistra, who actually uh, works 
for. So, uh, Paul, the floor is yours for uh, 15 minutes as well in terms of talking about the Yorkshire situation. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, can you just confirm you can see the screen and hear me OK? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. And uh, I understand that it's quite a few of you from different parts of Yorkshire, which is good because I've got a few images uh, later in the talk, which I hope reflect progress ar around the region. Um, just to say that um, yeah, I, I used to work for Sustrans for many years. I see a couple of people who uh, I, I've come across in that time are on the call tonight. <laughs> And um, in my role at Sistra, I'm taking a lead on active travel initiatives. And one of my roles is to chair the advisory group for the City Connect project in the West Yorkshire Leeds City region, which is making some great strides forward with um, investment in active travel. Um, what I thought I'd cover were just a, a little bit about some transport trends, some of it from the region, um, building upon what Fran has just showed you. Um, reflecting on some of the policy developments, which I think are going to be helpful here. Um, and then sharing some of the good practice to build upon what we've learned from London around the region and, and finishing up with some thoughts on what the immediate opportunities might be for us to promote active travel. So just to start, this is a, a slide which uh, comes from a, a, a West Yorkshire Combined Authority presentation, which is being uh, shared around the districts at the moment. They're looking at a carbon um, emissions pathway to, to bring down the uh, impact of carbon. And this is just to show, you know, the, the significance of transport. You can see there it's the, the highest. Well, we can only see you. Oh, yeah, you can Paul. only see me. Yeah, yeah. we right. need Let to show you just, screen. Let me just check why that's not. Okay. Uh, right. Have you got, have you pressed share screen on your yeah co-host? Yeah. I don't know why that's not happening in a second. Uh, Tell me. Uh, it's coming, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. Okay, excellent. Right. Let me just go back to start that again. Uh, okay, so that slides there, is it? You can see yeah. that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's just to, a summary of uh, the, the sort of carbon picture. You can see the dominance of transport there. Um, and what the combined authority is currently doing is, is consulting on carbon pathways and different scenarios that, that can uh, bring down the carbon impact from transport. There will need to be some offsetting uh, in other sectors, but what is significant in what I've seen so far is the importance of promoting active travel in, in the strategy to address this. And there's talk of a sort of 50, 60% increase in walking trips but a 20-fold increase in cycling. Now that's very ambitious. We're starting from a low base, uh, but if that was to be achieved, we'd, we're talking about sort of cycling levels that you'd see in Munich and uh, many other cities in Western Europe. And what that will require is a significant amount of investment. Um, starting point for all this is that the economic decisions that get made around um, what transport schemes to invest in we are hampered at the moment by some of the government guidance on transport appraisal. Um, I don't want to go into that here, but it, it, it's, it's critical in, in terms of swinging investment decisions in the future. And my colleagues have um, written a, an interesting paper on what needs to change here. And I've put on... Paul, I think you've got a, a dodgy connection. Your voice keeps fading. Um... Is it? Okay, let me... Let me try without my microphone. Is that any better, Dave? Yeah. That's, let me try that. Okay. So Thanks. this is just to point you towards a paper that my colleagues have written about um, what needs to change in terms of the way transport investment decisions are made. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a web link on that slide, which if you want to go and find it on the Sistra website, you might find that quite interesting. 
But that I don't want to dwell on that because it's quite a complex area, but it is something that does definitely need to change in future. Um, so in terms of what's happening with transport, it's a moving feast, um, the impact of COVID and travel restrictions and lockdown. Um, we're now in a situation where um, half the population is uh, currently working from home. We've seen increases in leisure walking and cycling, um, and they've tailed back, obviously, as, as more people have been staying at home. Currently in October, we saw that 30% of uh, rail trips had returned, 60% of bus trips had returned, um, but 90% of car trips had returned, and that's quite significant. Um, and also the other, the other thing that's, that we're having to battle with is, is the amount of home deliveries. So um, in terms of vans, there's been a 71% a growth in the number of vans on the road whilst there's been a 13% increase in terms of cars over the last 20 years. So uh, major changes in travel patterns, and, and this is going to be very difficult to, to predict in future. But the graph there just shows what happened in May and June when we had the first lockdown. And we, we saw a 200% increase in cycling at weekends and a doubling of cycling during the week. So really significant increases in cycling, particularly uh, amongst leisure cyclists and a lot of people, as Fran said, who are cycling again uh, for the first time. And what we shouldn't forget is before COVID arrived, the, there were some really significant changes in travel patterns happening because of investment. This is a picture from London, from Blackfriars Bridge. Um, and in that three year period since it was opened, uh, there'd been a 5% increase in the number of cyclists. And currently, nearly three quarters of the traffic on Blackfriars Bridge is cyclists. So really significant. And, um, and the reason for that is quite clear. If you look at the picture, you can see that that route is wide and it's segregated and there is room for pedestrians beside the cycle path. So um, very important. But we've seen similar increases where this sort of investment has been made in Yorkshire. So the cycle superhighway between Leeds and Bradford, starting from a much lower base, has seen a 45% increase in, in cycling over a similar time period. So the proof is that if you segregate and provide safe routes, um, cycling will increase. Now, it's important to think about the potential for change. Um, there was a report that came out with the cycling propensity tool, which the government sponsored, which showed that if- Fading again, uh, Paul. Okay. Uh, do anything else about this day but, uh, yeah. but we'll, we'll keep going um hopefully the side the slide is self-explanatory but um if people in england were as likely as the dutch to cycle trips of similar length and hilliness nearly one in five of us would cycle to work lots of potential and very important as well to mention gender uh, if you look at germany denmark the netherlands Half the cyclists there are female. Uh, in this country, it's less than 25%. So, and the re key reason why women aren't cycling is that they feel much less safe than men on the road and they need safe cycle routes. So safety is absolutely critical. In terms of what's happened recently, um, the government has brought out new design guidance, um, which is very clear that local authorities should be investing in segregated cycling infrastructure. They should be providing appropriate crossings and, um, and, and providing sufficient width for people to share roads. And that in many cases requires reallocation of road space. The gear change document, which came out in the summer, um, uh, announced two billion pounds of funding nationally to promote walking and cycling and some of that was to be spent on emergency active travel schemes which were there to provide social distance opportunities for physical activity and to provide an alternative to the reductions in public transport so now i'll just do a quick fire trip through some of the success stories around yorkshire um, this is a scheme in York, uh, sponsored by the City Council and the Combined Authority, widening a, 
and a, a, what had been a very narrow footbridge across the River Ouse. And there's been a, um, a thousand extra journeys being made each day on that bridge, more walking, more cycling. Uh, and that's through good design. The cycle superhighway um, I mentioned between Leeds and Bradford, they've seen uh, just seen a million trips on that route. Uh, and as I said, a 45% increase in cycling along that important corridor. This slide is just to, to show the importance of, of designing for people at a very human scale. Um, this is an example from Bradford of a, a diagonal crossing, uh, enabling cyclists to cross a, a busy junction in one stage and not having to take two separate stages. So some innovation going on in, in Bradford. Um, but also something I've learned while I've been doing the job is, is how little things make enormous differences to uh, individuals. And, and for example, if you're disabled and there's a significant slope on the uh, approach to the road coming off the footway, and you've got to take one hand off the wheel of your wheelchair to press the button, that presents some major hazard and the possibility that you might roll into traffic. So just seeing how engineers are now adapting designs to be much more um, friendly to people of all mobility abilities. This is a picture of the same road in York, you'll know it well, Dave, um, Tadcaster Road, one of the main corridors in, in York for cycling. Um, now, the picture on the left shows the road just before it was um, resurfaced and relined. But what, what I think is, is staggering is how the poor maintenance of roads, there are absolutely no cycle markings. You'll see on the left, there should be a cycle logo there that's nearly completely worn away. And there's actually a rut in the road where the, the white lines used to be. And, and that appears on York cycle map as a cycle route, but at the moment it's anything but. In fact, it's worse than a cycle route because of the potholes. Now, the picture on the right shows the impact of resurfacing and actually widening the cycle lanes. Um, and I think this is a real opportunity in, in, in York to put some extra protection there in terms of uh, wands or, or some form of um, physical divider between the cycle lane and traffic. But what that slide does show is, you know, even with cycle lanes, which many of us are unhappy with, just repainting them uh, makes an enormous difference in terms of how safe you can feel on the road. And at a very basic level, we need to be repainting cycle lanes more frequently than we do. Um, over to the east, um, this is the new bridge over the A63 in Hull. And absolutely fantastic that the, high, the, highways, are, the highways England and uh, in combination with Hull City Council are putting a, a new link across from the city centre through to the docks and down where the deep is. Um, and of course, this is a major gateway to the city um, and a sign to any people coming off the ferry from uh, Holland that actually the UK does invest in walking and cycling. So really good example of some high quality infrastructure that's going in and should be opened later this year. And another example from, um, from Hull, some of their emergency active travel schemes. So rather similar to Fran's pictures, proper segregation from traffic and taking uh, highway space away and, and giving that back to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, integrating journeys. This is the express bus between York and, and the East Coast. And um, there have been eight new buses provided, which have uh, their, their hybrid buses, low emission vehicles, but they're actually providing for cycling. So hats off to um, East riding buses for doing this. and. Uh, this is something that will benefit people in rural areas with more rollout of services like this. So um, a good, good example of how cycling can be promoted uh, and, and um, integrated with longer journeys. Now moving to South Yorkshire, and this is a slide of the consultation that's just gone on, uh, looking at potential active travel schemes. They've had over 4,000 responses uh, in South Yorkshire. And that is informing their investment program, which they've just announced, which will involve um, nearly 600 miles of new cycleway, 800 crossings and um, 20 square miles of low traffic neighborhoods. So 
great to see the ambition that um, the the uh, the South Yorkshire Sheffield City region is showing. Um, I'll come on to some more examples from South Yorkshire in a moment. This uh, this is another opportunity that we have, obviously, is creating safe social space. That need continues. Um, we haven't got rid of COVID yet, um, um, but unlike the scheme that Fran showed us in London, I think the quality of some of the ways in which these schemes have been introduced to rest elsewhere in the country, they've done nothing to <laughs> really benefit the, the provision for pedestrians and cyclists. So that's an example on the left from York, which had to be put in very quickly. Uh, and there was, I know there was a lack of um, materials to actually achieve that segregation. But what we should really be looking at is the sort of scheme like you see on the bottom, which is a picture from Waltham Forest in London. Um, and that's the sort of quality social space that we should be creating near our um, urban retail centres like the one on the left. So I said to go back to South Yorkshire. Um, this is part of their programme. The top on the left, you can see this is a scheme that's been approved to, to start in Doncaster, um, reviving social space around the old Great North Road through the town. Um, the picture below it is the uh, plan for Town Hall Square in Sheffield, funded through the Transforming Cities funding they've received. And on the top right, this is a scheme that's already gone in the low traffic neighbourhood in Kellam Island, which is just outside the city centre. So some really good examples of things that are happening or are about to happen in South Yorkshire. Now, we shouldn't forget our rural areas and we shouldn't forget that Yorkshire is a, is a, a tourism gem and the country attracting visitors from this country and abroad. Um, this is the route between York, uh, between Whitby and Scarborough, part of the North City Cycle Route. Uh, Sustrans are developing this, and they've got funding to resurface much of this route, which is an old railway line uh, across some dramatic scenery like the Larpool Viaduct outside Whitby. Um, and this is going to be an important part of our economy reviving post-COVID. Tourism, both domestically and international, is going to be something that we absolutely need to invest in at the same time as providing physical activity opportunities for people living locally. And access to green space is even more important, I think, for people living in our cities. This is a, a schematic network of the Bradford um, Cycle Ambition Programme. Um, and Bradford has some amazing green space outside the city, but it's very difficult to get to if you live in some of the deprived areas at the centre of the city. Um, but there are um, schemes in place and, and, and being planned to, to open up that access. And, you know, I think what I would stress here is that there's a mental health challenge um, and something we absolutely will need to address moving forward. And, and we all know that physical activity is a key um, pill in terms of reducing people's mental illness. So hats off to what's happening in Bradford and parts of... Uh, West Yorkshire at the moment. Um, it's not just about infrastructure, it's about engaging hearts and minds. And if there is one group of people that we need to focus our attention on coming out of COVID, it's young people. Um, they've taken the brunt, I think, of, of the, the lockdown. And uh, the big pedal, uh, working with schools to promote scooting and cycling and the Walk to School initiative, which Living Streets run, are absolutely critical in terms of um, promoting physical activity on the school journey. Um, we're lucky in this country, I think over half of journeys are made to school on foot, which is, is a, something we can really build on. But we have very low rates of cycling to school. And, uh, and I think that's an area that certainly needs attention going forward. So I'm just coming to the close now, but just some of the innovations that we might want to tap into and in new technologies. Um, there's going to be, I think, more focus in the future on uh, monitoring physical activity, um, car personal carbon audits, and of course, we've got many apps that can help you do that. Um, electric and pedal assist cycle freight, real opportunity for growth there. Transport for London produced a report saying that one in seven uh, vans could be taken off the road if, uh, if good um, cycle freight systems were put in place. The market for electric bikes, which is going to increase the cycling range and enable cycling in, in hillier cities, 
um, is, is enormous. Um, there were 2 million electric or pedelec uh, assist bikes sold in Germany last year. And it's projected that there will be, um, I think, two, 140 million um, electric bikes sold over the next three years globally, which will certainly surpass the number of electric cars that are sold. The other slide I put up there is the importance of providing cycle storage near our um, public housing. If you live in a flat, um, there's very little space to store bikes. And yet these are the very people that we need to support, perhaps most of all, in terms of promoting cycle access. So um, secure cycle parking in community facilities is an area that absolutely needs to be supported. So that's my summary slide really, just to say that um, we should embrace some of the digital technology in terms of gathering information about the demand for cycling and walking facilities, um, apps to promote cycling and walking, uh, and the new um, cycle types around their electric bikes. A real easy win for us is to reassess some of the highway maintenance plans, look at uh, widening cycle lanes when they get painted on the roads, um, and, and revisiting some of that infrastructure just with white paint could be enormously useful. Um, we're going to need to support our urban centres, which have taken a hit from COVID, um, and taking traffic out of those centres is going to be very important. We need to focus on young people, um, uh, helping them travel actively at school, but also supporting social enterprise and green jobs. And uh, in many ways, most importantly, I think giving everyone access to green space is going to address the mental health challenge that we face. That's all from me. Sorry about the sound quality. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, again, absolutely excellent uh, presentation. Loads, loads of good stuff in there. Right. Um, chance uh, for everybody to ask questions of the speakers. Um, and once we've had a, a, a decent Q&A session, we need to move on to a wider discussion about uh, what we can do in Yorkshire. OK, um, so uh, please use the chat facility and I'll try and fish out the questions to the speakers. Uh, there's been quite a lot of comments so far. Uh, right. Fran. Um, from Matthew Hill, have you been able to collaborate on designs with TfL uh, and the local councils rather than just be consulted on their proposals? Um, in the first round, it was a bit of a mixed bag. So uh, I have a colleague who's Simon Monk, who's the infrastructure campaigner, um, who has uh, does a lot of that design work with councils and TfL. But as I said, we've also got uh, local groups in nearly every borough. So where those local groups have really good relationships with the council, they will generally get them in early, ask their opinion, they'll be back and forth and opportunities to feedback rather than slapping the final proposal down in front of them. Um, the other thing that happened with Tranche, one of the funding in London is that um, a lot of boroughs used it as an opportunity to deliver schemes that they'd already been working on where that engagement had already started and been happening. Tranche 2 might be a little bit different, although um, one of the things that I think we're hearing from TfL and the government is that they're quite keen to learn some of the lessons from Tranche 1. So one of the big issues with the first round of emergency active travel funding was the consultation. So where uh, things were rushed out very quickly and which isn't necessarily a bad thing in our opinion to trial something, which is essentially what nearly everything was. It's all put in under emergency measures. They have time limits on it. Very few things went in permanent straight off the bat. But that open conversation with the council, that ability for people to feed back on things to say, oh, it's not working because everything's suddenly coming down my road. That open conversation wasn't really there for a lot of the councils, a lot of the councils were caught on the back foot of that. So what we're expecting is that consultation engagement is going to be a little bit better in the second round uh, of funding. So there will be more chance to, to feed in and suggest and tweak things before they go in. But we're hoping that's not going to slow everything down too much. Mm. Just, just on that point, Fran, do you want to talk about some of the consultation processes used in London, for instance, in mm. Walsham Forest? Um, you know, we've said, I mean, I'm in York and we've had two of the 
spring schemes uh, come out or, or, or due to come out. Uh, yeah. There was no cons pre consultation uh, and the council was very slow to react to quite some legitimate criticisms, which if addressed mm -hmm. might have saved at least one of the schemes. Um, yeah, so I think before COVID, we were definitely, we've been doing a lot of work on this. So actually I'll stick another link in the, the chat box, but we actually produced a consultation and engagement guide earlier this year for councillors um, because we were having a really big problem. I think it wasn't unique to London in that the consultation process was broken. What we were having were uh, two year consultations from councils on removing four parking spaces. And then there would be massive pushback on removing four parking spaces. So they'd only remove two and you'd spend three years getting two parking spaces removed on the street. It wasn't working. The pace was too slow given the crises that we were facing. So we were doing a lot of work with TfL and with councils about changing that and doing a lot more upfront engagement with councils. And actually, Paul, I was really interested to see the stuff happening in South Yorkshire on this in terms of don't go in with a final product. Don't go in with the um, fully formed consultation proposal that you've pumped thousands of pounds into as a council officer and hours and hours of work. And it's too difficult to change when you start getting feedback but go to communities and say, what do you like about your area? What don't, like your, don't, what don't you like about your area? Gathering that feedback and then saying, okay, so you think that there is a problem with traffic in your area. These are the ways that we can solve that. And then starting to have that conversation and building it up. So co-designing the eventual scheme with the community who are going to be impacted by the scheme. So that's where we were getting to and where we're hoping to get to again uh, once the emergency measures uh, start slowing down and we can start getting back into that rhythm of having the time to do the early engagement. Where that has changed at the moment is the fact that we need to get stuff in as quickly as possible to avoid this car-based recovery. So that's where it flips from being that early engagement co-design process to being a trial. And let's see if the trial works. Let's have that conversation while the trial is in, if we need to tweak it, if we need to change it, we can do that. And then we can have a conversation after six months and say, has it worked? Has it not worked? How can we improve it? What can we do? So there's sort of two different ways of doing that depending on the time scale that you have. Um, but both of them depend on councils and transport authorities being really open and being really transparent about their decision-making and having a genuine conversation with the people on the ground. Thanks. Paul, there's a question from Ludie Simpson um, re regarding your role as chair of the Independent Advisory Group. Um, she's uh, uh, it, The question is asking whether the advisory board has a seat on the planning team meetings um, and is, is this arrangement for continuous consultation and engagement common for West Yorkshire Combined Authority? Uh, he's, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there's an interest here in terms of the uh, Bradford Shipley Road scheme. Yeah, the um, the advisory group was really set up to provide um, an input from user groups. So on, we've got people from Sustrans, Living Streets, um, the various cycle campaigns around the uh, around West Yorkshire, um, and uh, I think um, we had a public health official as well, um, someone from British uh, Cycling UK, um, and also a Clean Air Leads uh, representative. Um, we were there really to provide um, a, a user's perspective on some of the designs that were coming forward uh, and, and act as a sounding board to the scheme designers and uh, strategists. Um, so that's what the clues in the name we provide advice we're not we're not a decision making body uh, but, but i have a i do attend the city connect program board now that isn't um influencing the design of every transport scheme across west yorkshire it's just very particular ones that are funded through that program but moving forward they they they've, they've accepted that the advisory group has played a very positive role and they want it to have a greater say in informing the future design of, of other transport schemes from the perspective of bus users, pedestrians and cyclists. Um, but yes, we, we, we don't sit on any planning committees. That's, that's not our role. Yeah, okay. 
Right. Uh, Fran, uh, there's quite a lot of questions for you, but if we perhaps <laughs> just kick off with two. Uh, mm. One one is about how real has the pushback been against uh, cycle lanes in, in London? Um, and I think the obvious other question about that is how how is the cycle campaign uh, responding to that and trying to uh, uh, ensure that it <laughs> that uh, we we don't lose out from it. Um, mm. And the other one was about twenty mile an hour limit schemes and their impact and whether they do uh, encourage more active travel. Um, so I'll take the first one in that. Um, yeah. The Pushback's been pretty uh, fierce. <laughs> um, our, our brilliant campaigners, uh, our local campaigners have been dealing with the, the brunt of it and um, which can be tricky at times, I think with uh, active travel campaigning because you end up campaigning for, you know, your road or the road next to you and it's your community and you, you know, th there's lots of stories about, I mean, you have very frank conversations with people in the street as you're doing your shopping at the weekend kind of uh, situation. So the pushback has been quite fierce. Um, it's also been quite uh, joined up. Uh, we have in uh, a lot of boroughs now a one group. So one Wandsworth, one Lambeth, one Southwark, um, which are groups that are fighting the uh, emergency measures. So they're actively working to get low traffic neighborhoods pulled out. They're actively working to get cycle lanes pulled out. Um, to be honest, none of the tactics that they're using, we haven't seen before. Um, what we're just seeing is a larger volume of them because we've got a larger volume of schemes happening that is pretty unprecedented in London. Um, so the, the way that we've been dealing with it is a way that we normally deal with it. So engaging in a polite and positive way with everyone who gets in contact with us is really important, um, particularly in terms of reflecting the positive news and the positive reaction back up at councillors, officers and decision makers. Because um, what we tend to find is uh, people, when they're annoyed or angry about something, that's when they'll write to their MP. They won't write to their MP if they like something or don't really mind about something. So one of the things we try and do is encourage that positive feedback to the decision makers. Um, it's really important. Uh, it makes such a difference. Um, and shoring up, and that's part of shoring up the political will. So what we've seen is some boroughs who have had quite fierce pushback against the schemes going in. But they've held firm. They've said, nope, we're sticking with the whole trial. We're going to wait until it's been, you know, a year, 18 months, the length of the trial. Then we'll do an assessment. We will ask for feedback and get feedback in that time. Um, and they're staying firm. And then we've had other boroughs who have panicked when they've had a few emails and have pulled something out. So ones where I've pulled out a low traffic neighborhood quite early on. I think it had only been in for three days. It was something ridiculously short. Um, so there's been a mixture, but broadly, it's moving in the right direction. The majority of stuff is staying in. We've only had very few instances of things coming out. And I think one of the benefits is the fact that it's coming from the government as well as the mayor. So for us, that government announcement, the gear change document was massively helpful. Um, it meant there was a less of a political divide over this, which was starting to look like that was going to be quite a big thing in London, um, but also meant that we could point to national funding. So this wasn't a London mayor pushing forward with these schemes. It was a national initiative, and that's been really powerful for us. Um, the other question about 20 mile an hour. Uh, yes, uh, we support 20 mile an hour in London. We've seen a couple of boroughs who weren't doing 20 mile an hour implement it. I think Kensington, Chelsea has been one of the central London holdouts for 20 mile an hour uh, for years. They're going 20 mile an hour tomorrow. So we've seen a couple of councils implement that as part of their uh, response to COVID. Um, in terms of the grand scheme of things, it is one of the things that helps, but it's not the only thing that helps. So if everywhere goes 20 mile an hour, that won't encourage a massive boom in cycling, but it supports that feeling of safety when people are moving about um, and also it reduces road danger because people have more time to react when they're in their vehicles. So it's a positive thing for active travel, but it shouldn't be the only thing that 
uh, active travel campaigners are pushing for. Okay. Right. Um, question to both of you. I'll, I'll ask Paul uh, to respond first. What would you, uh, what we'd like to see in terms of traffic law reform, in particular uh, revisions to the highway code, which has been out uh, for uh, consultation, but in terms of uh, encouraging active travel, and perhaps Anzia might want to come in from the CILT's point of view as well. So Paul first. Yeah, I th well, I, I know there's been a big campaign to respond on the issue of close passing um, and leaving sufficient sufficient space when you overtake a cyclist in a car. I think that's a, a very important one. Um, anything that reinforces the priority for pedestrians and cyclists at crossing side roads is critical. Mm -hmm. because motorists just aren't aware that, that they should be giving way uh, when they're making a turn off a main road. Um, the big, the big one, of course, is um, is, is liability, uh, and that's the big difference in 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 other European countries where um, where there's a, an assumption that the driver is at fault in most traffic accidents involving a pedestrian or a cyclist, and the driver has to prove that they weren't at fault. Um, but we have the opposite situation in this country, um, where you're innocent until, until proven guilty. And I'm not sure how we address that. I mean, that, that, that seems to me to be the really big one that we have to resolve, but um, it does go to the heart of British law. And I think it's proved very difficult to get that changed. But any kind of message in, in the highway code itself that, that strength and thinking around that would be useful. Mm. Fran? Uh, I've not got a huge amount to add on that. I think, as you say, like the prioritisation for cyclists and pedestrians is really important, and that that crossing at junctions is a is a key thing. Um, so, not not a huge amount to add to that, um, other than we're hoping to see some positive changes in the highway code. And obviously, off the back of any change to the highway code, what we'd like to see is a big public information campaign to let everyone know about the changes to the highway code, because everyone who's got their license won't necessarily be looking at that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Anzia, do you want to add anything from CILT point of view? I, I don't think I've got anything specifically from the stuff that I've been working on, but I, because he's here, um, might be interesting to lean on Richard Armitage um, uh, because he's got much more experience in that area. Yeah. If he's got anything to add? Yeah. Richard, do you want to come in? Ah, hello. <laughs> um, I was slightly asleep there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for putting you on the spot. We were asking about cha the changes to the highways code and what could be done to help uh, active travel. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, yeah, well, now I was listening to that. But to be honest with you, I've deferred to people far, far more intelligent and, and experienced on that side of things than myself on that right. subject. And I, okay. I deliberately stayed away from it, um, mainly because I'm so occupied with uh, everything to do with cargo bikes. Sorry to disappoint, uh, Dave. Um, no, it's okay. It's just, uh, it's just trying to widen it. Um, so, uh, Dave, Dave, can I can I pick out one of the questions um, from yeah. the audience that sort of changes the subject slightly? There's a question about bike security that I think um, gets to the nub of one of the issues that prevents people from cycling. It's from Jane from Leeds Greenpeace. She says cycling uh, security is a big issue when you have a bike and want to park it somewhere or even store it safely at home. When you live in an apartment there are parking spaces where i live for every apartment but no safe cycling parking and a lot of resistance to removing a parking space to install one so i'd particularly like to ask paul whether within the sort of framework of what um, uh, city connect is doing whether both residential and in my case the town center in huddersfield uh, lacks any secure uh, parking except on the railway platform um, how high is that in the in the hierarchy of things that we need to do to get this 200 fold increase in cycling? Yeah, well, um, I know in West Yorkshire they've, they've invested in quite a lot of extra cycle parking in in Leeds city centre and they've got a grant scheme that operates with businesses. Um, in terms of residents, 
residents, I think that's a, that is a trickier one because you're generally dealing with private land. Um, but there are examples of some authorities that are putting in the sort of street bike shelters. Um, and they are, you know, they are taking away uh, parking spaces on the basis that they're providing a facility that benefits multiple residents. Um, I think a lot of this is just about being bold and, and sometimes doing things as a trial, you know, a long-term trial saying, we're gonna take this space away for a year, we're gonna put some cycle park in there and see how well it's used. Um, I think sometimes that's the best way of getting around these things. It's, uh, it is the politics of reall reallocating road space. It's, uh, it's a hotbed, but you have to jump into that um, arena if we're gonna make progress. Um, but trials, I think, are important because, you know, as, as you know, Dave, from way back when the pedestrianisation of um, York City Centre was done, the opposition to pedestrianising streets was enormous. Um, but the council then had the vision and the, the courage to take traffic out on the basis of it being a trial, um, but a long term trial. And at the end of that trial, none of the businesses wanted their scheme to end. So yeah. it's, it's the same to be done, you know, done on a, on, a, on a micro level, just with a single parking space outside of a block of flats. The, the, the other thing on parking, certainly for new developments, is you, we just need to make sure all councils have adequate parking standards in their, in their uh, planning um, uh, building control arrangements. You know, we've, we've had those in York for 20 years, so all new flat developments have the secure cycle parking, usually in a corner of, of the car park at the bottom. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, as I... you say, that's only for new, that obviously only covers new developments. Yeah, so uh, obviously this is this is very London specific, but in London, um, we have the London plan, which uh, specifies that uh, car food planning is a default. Um, so no new build should have car parking unless uh, the public transport accessibility index, the PTEL, is um, a certain number. So if the, if the public transport accessibility is low, then car parking is allowed. Um, what we suggested, and it's one of the things um, in that eight priority list is around car free planning so rather than using this public transport accessibility index which basically says oh there's no bus or tube or train near this development therefore you can have uh, 1.5 car parking spaces for every flat to say actually um, it should be what we call a climate safe modes accessibility index so if that isn't uh, possible to get public transport is there another option? So is there a demand responsive bus that can go through there? Is there cycle tracks that can be delivered as part of that development to connect it up? And actually we should be planning all new builds as zero car, but making sure that that accessibility is still there for public transport and active travel. Um, particularly, I know this is a problem outside of London more than in London, but you do see developments still being built uh, where the planners have planned for everyone to drive everywhere. So the path to the neighboring town or the local train station doesn't exist. It's just a road. So moving away from that uh, assumption that new developments have to have uh, car parking spaces and into a car free. Uh, but also, as you say, putting in uh, cycle parking, secure cycle parking in developments and in housing where that already is uh, it's not a new build, there's no planning regulations, but as you say, it's reallocating road space and putting in cycle hangers, taking away parking space to provide 10 cycle spaces. Uh, councils need to be brave and just go for it because that is a massive barrier if you don't have the space inside your building. Yeah, yeah. Just, just one more question that's uh, on cycle parking. Uh, Jean Margots uh, has asked, what about cycle parking in tourism places? She, she lives in Carl Valley where the canal path is due to be upgraded. Many cyclists call at cafes in Slowet and Marsden, um, but they've got no cycle racks. Is funding available? Paul, might you know anything on that? Um, ooh, um, I mean, I'm sure um, Kirkley's council will have a budget for cycle parking, but depending on how much you need, I think the first point of course should probably be the the, the parish council or the um, you know one of the, the um, funds that might support um, business within the town centre. I mean, it, it isn't expensive, um, uh, relatively small grants. And 
um, I think, Jean, there is a scheme uh, being consulted on shortly to improve the towpath between Huddersfield and, uh, and Slowit. So there may be something you can, uh, that might provide an incentive to get that funded ahead of that investment. Right. Um, comments from both speakers. There's been uh, much mentioned on cycle and walking to for, for seemingly the entire journey. However, many journeys, especially those involving public transport, can involve active travel at each end. Um, what any particular thoughts on on the, on that, Fran? Um. Yes, I think it's increasingly important to involve uh, multimodal journeys. Um, I, I thought it was amazing that example in Paul's presentation about the bus, which allows bikes on it. I'd love if we had a couple of those in London. But again, it comes back to parking in some instances. Uh, we have a lot of tube and train stations across London where you have you know, a couple of Sheffield stands and then a massive car park. That's still the norm. Um, and National Rail are really reluctant to make any changes to their land that would improve cycle parking. I know that's a point of contention uh, between, uh, you know, councils, TFL and Network Rail. They seem just very reluctant to make any kind of shift. But I think it is incredibly, incredibly important um, to cater for that. You see it increasingly in the Netherlands uh, that multimodal journey is becoming more and more important. They're doing a lot more thinking about it as that uh, uh, mode shift continues to go up um, so I think we're we're a little bit behind the curve on that to be honest we need a lot more work to do towards linking up those public transport and active travel journeys what what I would say on on that I think I think certainly um, a lot of uh, the investment schemes that are coming forward are about improving cycle access to stations the transforming cities investment in Sheffield and uh, Leeds is certainly focusing on routes to the stations and providing uh, high quality cycle parking there. Um, I mean, the issue of traveling with your bike on a bus and a train uh, is, is more challenging, uh, certainly for buses. And the key breakthrough there is if, is if we could get legislation changed to be able to put the, to be able to put racks on the front of buses, because I think uh, if that were allowed as they do in America and North America and parts of Europe, that would make a big difference. Um, bikes on trains is going to be interesting because we really don't know how, um, how passengers are going to return to trains in the numbers that they were before. And the obstacle to getting bikes on trains has always been one of passenger capacity and having no room to put bikes on there. Now, we may find, as people work from home more, in future that uh, fewer people on the trains, releasing more space to, for people to be able to put bikes on them. And people may be traveling more off peak as well. So uh, I think there's some potential in the future. The, the obstacle up to now has been, we haven't got any room on trains at peak hours. So you just mm -hmm. can't bring your bike on a train. Yeah, I have to say, I remember coming up to, to Yorkshire for the, the tour de Tour de France and uh, having to have a massive conversation with the train guard on the way back because they still only had two spaces for bikes on trains for the Tour de France weekend, which was blew my mind a little bit. Mm. But <laughs> um, but that 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 point about capacity is really important. And just just on parking as well at stations, like parking at stations. Uh, again, it's the security, it's the capacity, but it's also the capacity for. Uh, adaptive bikes and different bikes. So what we'd like to see is as the mode share increases, we get more and more people cycling, we're actually gonna see a wider range of cycles. We're gonna see more cargo bikes. We're gonna see more trikes. We're gonna see more tandems. They don't always fit in the standard Sheffield or one of those racks where you, um, I've forgotten the name of them, push them up. Uh, so I think there's gonna be that space is needed as well for those wider bike stands, those wider uh, and different, uh, parking options. Okay, right, we, we are getting towards the end of, uh, of the meeting and I think it's important we perhaps have a little bit of a discussion about where we go from here. Um, 
first of all, I think it, uh, one of the questions that was asked was uh, asking, you know, how, how many people here are actually yes, cyclists? Um, perhaps you might want to uh, use the yes, no buttons to, uh, to tell us that. Um, the, if you go to the participants uh, icon at the bottom of the screen and bring up the participants at the bottom of that subscreen, you'll see that there's a yes, no button at the bottom. So if you could tick yes if you're a cyclist uh, and no if you're not, let's just have a see of, of who we are, what we, what we do in terms of it. And yes, pretty overwhelming numbers of cyclists, but uh, a minority who, who, who aren't and a, a number of abstainers. So uh, yeah, okay, thank, thank you for that. R right. Um, before before we um, kicked off this meeting, Anzir and Chaz um, and myself were having a discussion about you know what what we could do in the future. Obviously, a lot of you are probably involved in uh, promoting active travel in your uh, particular localities, but we wondered in terms of Yorkshire wide. Um, what might be, you know, what what we might want to do uh, collectively, perhaps in terms of lobbying some of the, you know, the the, the sub-regional and regional uh, organisations and powers that be, uh, in terms of perhaps uh, coordinating information and campaigning, um, those sorts of things. So. Um, you know, what's what's your feelings about that, and what role uh, you know Zero Carbon Yorkshire and our transport subgroup uh, might be able to play on that? So uh, it might be easier if you just use the blue. Oh, sorry, I haven't got the blue hands up. So if you use the chat uh, box. Yes, uh, um, Jane from Leeds has talked about lobbying the Metro Mayor uh, candidates, uh, and I think we cert that's certainly one of the things that we could do. Um, ah, so, right, everyone except host can raise a hand. <laughs> I was wondering where my blue button was. <laughs> Re-educating our traffic managers. Um, Paul, given your involvement both professionally and, and with the uh, Connect. What, what do you think about that particular question and what we might be able to do on that front? What, um, lobbying metro mayors? Well, need to re-educate our traffic managers. I, you know, I, I remember the old Friends of the Earth, uh, yeah. 36 items, one of which was uh, not employing uh, traditional yeah. engineers on cycle schemes because they were all totally roads orientated. Sure. Well, I think, I think the, um, the new design guidance that's come out, LTM 120, is going yeah. to be very helpful there. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a very good document. It's it's very well designed and, and clear. And the government has been pretty clear in its message in that any funding that it allocates for cycling, you know, um, any designs that come forward through that process have to meet the um, the specifications in that design guide unless there's a good reason why they can't and I will focus minds in future amongst design teams and hopefully what will happen now is that some of the local authorities will um, employ someone to come in and do some training design training and introductions to the design manual so I guess something we could all do is just prompt our um local highway departments to ask ask that question are you planning uh, any training sessions for your engineers on the new cycle design guidance okay it's it's not always just about design uh, guidance is it paul you know, i think we all know that if you're a cyclist you you you, you have a basic nous about what works and what doesn't work from your own experience uh, use, using facilities. And, you know, I think encouraging people who are involved in design, not just to read the manuals, but to actually get out mm. there, experience it themselves is, is, is also a crucial piece of what, need, what needs to happen. Um, in York, the cycle campaign here 
is basically getting its members to invite local councillors uh, to come and cycle with them and perhaps doing that with cycling with, with uh, transport officers on an organised basis to go and look at the particular problems in particular areas to experience different cycle facilities might be one way of engaging uh, with, with, with both of those groups uh, uh, and improving uh, the res their responsiveness on, on these issues. That's a thought for you. Yeah. Right. Friends of the Earth are, are already active uh, in uh, lobbying in West Yorkshire. Um, yeah, highways, departments, pro vehicle transport. Yes. If we've, we've got a, a blue hand from Bruce from right. Tuesday. Can we can we take him? Yes, he's, Bruce. He's usually good. He's usually good value. Right, <laughs> Bruce. Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, all. Um, uh, for my sins, I have found myself on the town deals board in Dewsbury. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, but the government uh, nominated 101 towns. Um, many of them in the north of England, um, for up to £25 million worth of investment. If you are in one of these towns, then it will have a town's deal board. The time frame for this to make a bid, and we are on the last tranche, which has to, a bid has to be in by uh, the end of January. Um, there's a whole process, but the, at the heart of it is the town's deal board, which is stakeholders. Um, and one of the requirements, of course, is that you have a vision for the future. And this is surely an opportunity that instead of, of um, I'm sure it's necessary, but piecemeal lobbying in different avenues, this is an avenue into the heart of the council's planning process and um, grant funding, um, the ability to obtain grant funding, whether it's from uh, central government or uh, regional or whatever. So if you're in a town with a, which is one of the 100 world towns, then there is a town steel board and there will be community representatives on that board. Uh, reaching them and inputting through them and identifying to, they are the people that you need to educate because they can get the this whole issue into the vision. Um, in Kirklees, um, we have a an active travel policy where the, the council says, you know, active travel, walking and cycling has priority over road. But when it comes to actually implementing schemes, lo and behold, you're fighting the same old battle. There isn't an assumption that walking and cycling take priority. We, so it's necessary to get that message across and you need to do it through the most effective channels. And the yeah. town board, the town deal board will be one of those channels. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks very much, Bruce. Right, uh, Jane uh, from Leeds Greenpeace, uh, uh, referring to their recent uh, event. Um, when uh, it was obvious to them that both cyclists and motorists uh, need to be educated about their road uh, behaviours. Um, perhaps, you know, that, that perhaps flags an issue about when the, uh, if the highways code is going to be changed on a number of aspects, what is the government going to do in terms of actually spreading the new messages that that might involve? And that's perhaps something that ought to be uh, flagged to them. Uh, you know, coming back to Paul's earlier contribution about about behaviours. In the last three years, I have taken the um, the wing mirror off two vehicles that passed me that close that their mirrors hit my handlebars. <laughs> it's <laughs> you know, it's absolutely staggering what 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 does go on out there. So, Dave. Can I make a suggestion um, yes. to answer to answer the, the point that you raised about what we might do next um, as a group? Um, I've already said at the very beginning, and not everyone was here at the time, that we have a we have part of our group that's involved in a, a the rail decarbonisation campaigning, uh, which is quite a critical time at the moment. Um, and obviously, there are, there were questions about the importance of public transport and how the demise of public transport during the COVID is not good for cycling, but we, we, we'll, we'll pass that one over. But there is, a, there is a symbiotic relationship between the two. But what, what I think we concluded, and in the time remaining, you might have some views on it, was that the, the cycling lobby 
in certain respects is quite well organized. But the issue that Fran raised earlier on about understanding better techniques of, of consultation with communities, um, which I'm going to a workshop that Civic Voice are running tomorrow, which is, which is about how you engage with people, uh, particularly in areas where there is no infrastructure already through parish councils or through, um, through um, community organizations to ensure that, you know, when the active cycling, active, uh, cycling and walking agenda um, is a possibility that it that it's brought in with with the consent and involvement of local people. So so perhaps what we could do is actually as a group as look at good examples of both consultation, participation, and new design, new, which you both focused on really well. New design in neighbourhoods that make them livable, because I think the walking and the livability factors are just as important as the cycling, and the cycling is quite well organised, despite you know there being um, serious limitations in getting from where we are to 200% um, increase. Yeah. And that way, we, we, it's about good practice. I'm just suggesting we might do more on um, examples of good practice. I've got one thumbs up at least. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, we're obviously coming to the end of the meeting. Um, hasn't been a particular bite on uh, on my question about what we or you know is there a role for us collectively to try and do things in yorkshire in the future but if you want to think about that and let us know afterwards uh, please do so i'm i'm just going to pop my email address uh, on the uh, uh, in the chat function but um as i say we do we do need to uh, finish this meeting and i, I would it's kind of it's one of those things where I think there's been a lot of things on the chat that are kind of hinting at that, but whether that's sort of enough and whether people might be interested in in joining us at the Zero Carbon Yorkshire Transport Group to bring a lot of these things together within Yorkshire, I suppose. Yeah, I've got one volunteer already on the chat. So good, yeah. good. Okay. Can I thank everyone who's uh, joined us uh, th this evening, and especially can I thank our two speakers, uh, Fran and uh, Paul, for their uh, uh, excellent uh, introductory speaks, speeches for answering all those uh, questions and uh, telling us what's, you know, uh, what's going on in their areas uh, and what's going on in Yorkshire. Um, can you show your appreciation uh, either by unmuting yourself and clapping or using the uh, reactions buttons? Um, and can I uh, wish you a, a, good e a good rest of the evening uh, and perhaps uh, we'll see you again at one of our future meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right.